I'm Joan Beaumont, one of the um, staff of the Strategic Defence Studies Centre, and it's my great pleasure to chair um, this final session today. And we know our speakers are under strict instructions to be extremely exciting and provocative since they, it is the last session of the day. Um, the session is entitled Strategy and Domains, and we have a great cast, uh, Professor Paul Dibb, Dr Ewan Graham, and Dr Tim Huxley. Now, one of my little quirks is that I think one of the reasons that we provide biographies in the program is so that you know who the people are, and I don't necessarily need to read everything to you. Uh, but Professor Paul Dibb, I think, will be known to everybody in this audience, um, and uh, he is going to start with the return of geography. Uh, Dr Ewan Graham, who is head of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute in Sydney, will be speaking about maritime strategy in Asia, and Dr Tim Huxley from the IISS um, office in Singapore will be speaking about the evolution of military capacity in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Joan. Um, the title I've been given uh, for this talk is The Return of Geography, and many of you know I, I'm a geographer by training, and you'll hear more of that. But, uh, Joan, uh, with that introduction, I'm reminded of something that Hedley Bull uh, once said, and I quote, professors do not make good policy makers, unquote. That is true. The question is whether the reverse applies. Do, po do policy makers make good professors? And I shall leave that to your judgment. It's a pleasure, of course, for me as the uh, longest serving head of uh, SDSC to celebrate this 50th anniversary. Um, I'm reminded of the 30th anniversary um, 20 years ago, when, as David Horner will remember, we were close to extinction as a academic organization. The end of the Cold War had seen the drying up of funds, including from defense, uh, the master's program was no longer wanted. Um, the, we had myself, Des, and David, and precious little else. Um, and now we have, in the Strategic and Defense Studies Center, Bob, uh, on my count, stand corrected by Brendan, over 21 members of academic staff, including seven full professors. Um, excluding visiting fellows and PhD students. And as you've said, we, uh, we have a very large teaching program. Um, the one at the Command and Staff College, run very well by Daniel. Um, the, our own master's program, and now the very large undergraduate program. So we're a very big concern. If I might say so, and I've said this in staff meetings, we just need to pause and think about where we're going. Uh, we have expanded very rapidly, and I know many colleagues will disagree with what I'm about to say, but if we're not careful, we'll become a sort of cross between an international relations department and a military studies organization. And we've, we, we're starting to lose our core capability, which Tom Miller, Bob O'Neill, Des Ball built up, and that is Australian defence policy. And now there's a lot of competition, frankly. Um, the issue of geography and its return, whilst it's true that some theoreticians bought the superficial view at the end of the Cold War, that geography had had its day, that was never the view of those who were senior defence policy officers. Strategic theories come and go, but the abiding na nature of a nation's geography remains a key defence planning tool. To quote Australia's greatest permanent secretary for defence, Sir Arthur Tang, in 1986, and I quote, the map of one's own country is the most fundamental of all defence documentation. And you've got it there, and I shall address that shortly. I've given those of you from overseas a particular Australian geopolitical perspective. Now, geography clearly varies according to a nation's strategic circumstances and, importantly, its perceptions of threat or the lack of one. But geography operates for Australia as a crucial consideration when it comes to the defence of the continent and 
the location of the archipelago to our immediate north, which you can see there. Robert Kaplan argues in his book, The Revenge of Geography, we all need to recover sensibility about the relevance of space that has been lost in the current era when some commentators, like the New York columnist Thomas Friedman, talk glibly about a flat world where geography no longer matters. As Kaplan notes, the end of the Cold War led to a mistaken view that globalization and economic interdependence would inevitably lead to the end of geopolitical rivalries among the great powers and to the emergence of a more enlightened liberal order. Well, that has not happened. So despite the trendy talk of a borderless world, the control of territory, as we've heard in the last day, is still fundamental to world politics. I thought I would share with you my own approach to my conceptual approach, if you like, to the role of geography and geopolitics in the current era. era. So in the longer paper that I've written for um, the book, first of all, I address the importance of geopolitics in Putin's Russia and Moscow's challenge to the established borders in Europe. And I've just come back with Michael Wesley and Admiral Barry from a week in Moscow having talks uh, with the Russians. And uh, if you want a one-line sentence about a week in Russia, I first went there in 68 and as a declared intelligence officer in 76. So much has changed in Moscow and so much absolutely has not. Um, the second issue I want to discuss is China's territorial ambitions. I mentioned the South China Sea, but I will not be imposing on my uh, colleague Ewan Graham's uh, ground in that regard. I want to talk about some other geopolitical perspectives of China, which I've experienced in the last 10 years, representing Australia on behalf of our foreign ministry at 10 meetings of the ASEAN Regional Forum group, which goes under the marvelous title of the Expert and Eminent Persons Group. I really like that. <laughs> and third, I will, if time's available, discuss the new importance of Australia's geographical location and its relevance to the US pivot to Asia, something that my former boss, Kim Beasley, has uh, brought to uh, public attention. But before I start on Russia, um, I want to say something um, about, if you like, my conceptual approach to the current strategic era. I see these three um, issues I've mentioned in the broader context of what I fear is a dangerous era, a view I share with my colleague Peter Ho from Singapore, former Permanent Secretary of Defense and the Foreign Ministry. I, f I fear we're facing a dangerous era, unfolding before us strategically at the global level. In my view, we have two large authoritarian powers, China and Russia, challenging the liberal international order led by the United States and its democratic allies at a time when domestic politics in the West are in disarray over the impact of globalization. Look at the United States. I was in the UK for Brexit. Look at the rest of Europe. And we had some of this a few weeks ago in the Australian election, the reaction adversely to globalization. Now is not the time for the West to be preoccupied domestically just when China and Russia are issuing challenges to the established order and flexing their military muscles in different ways. Turning then to the geographic ambitions of a resurgent Russia. They exist at two levels. To reassert Russia as a great power, Velika Dejava, and to recover lost territories. Putin is determined to recover Russia's standing in the Eurasian geopolitical space. As former British ambassador to Russia, Roderick Lyne explains, President Russia's new model, Russia, is that of an independent great power resuming its geopolitical position on its own terms. Lyne states that this reflects a deep sense of insecurity and a fear that Russia's interests would be threatened if it were to lose control of its neighborhood. Putin speaks of Russia's civilizing mission on the Eurasian continent. It's not decadent like Europe, he says. He claims the right to a sphere of strategic interest in Russia's neighborhood in which Western influence and involvement would be limited. That sphere, in my view, includes not only Crimea and Ukraine, but also the Baltic countries, Belarus, 
Moldova, and northern Kazakhstan. Putin's Russia is set on a path of confrontation with the West and is now challenging, to a degree, the established post-World War II security order in Europe. Uh, with respect, I disagree with my friend Lawrence Friedman. Uh, I think he dismisses Russia's um, strengths too easily. Sure, their economy has got real problems. Sure, their demography has got real problems. Well, don't take any joy from that. From what I know of spending 20 years of my life as an intelligence officer and academic on Russia, Russia, more than any other country, is a prisoner of its history, its geography, and its culture. And the weaker it gets, the more inclined Putin will be to lash out. He will not take yet another collapse of Russia after the failure of the Bolshevik Revolution, in which he says Russia was plundered and robbed by the West. Moscow, according to unclassified sources, is now capable, with no intelligence warning, of deploying 150,000 troops with little or no warning, as I've said, under the disguise, Maskarovka, of a major exercise into any of the countries of its near abroad. This is not to argue, let me stress, that Russia has recovered the military power of the former Soviet Union. It is not, but it needs to be remembered from Putin's perspective that Russia faces a weak and divided Europe. And it is a fact, whether we like it or not, that an overwhelming percentage of Russians do not accept that there can be such an independent state as a place called Ukraine. Putin describes it as Nova Russia, um, New Russia, which was conquered in Catherine the Great's time uh, from the Crimean Tartars. Many Western observers have consistently misread Russia and the way it's driven, as I've said, by its geography and history and culture. Managing the increasing threats Russia poses to international order is now arguably the most serious issue facing the Western international community. This is not to underestimate the challenge emanating from a rise in China, which I'll address momentarily, but China, unlike Russia, does not pose the same potential existential threat to world peace in the same way. It still has active and reserve over 5,000 strategic nuclear weapons and tens of thousands of tactical nuclear weapons, unlike China. At the very least, Moscow's attitude over the status of the 40 newly independent states formed out of the collapse of the Soviet Union is that they are intimately linked to Russia, are to a greater or lesser extent historically part of Russia, and form Russia's security perimeter. From Moscow's perspective, they must therefore be recognized as within Russia's sphere of strategic interest, and must not be permitted to act in ways that are deemed to be contrary to Russia's vital interests. As I've said, Putin sees his country as facing a weak Europe, ineffective and leaderless, overwhelmed by a huge refugee problem, and with the UK's exit from the EU as heralding the unraveling of European unity. Now, a lot of people in this audience won't agree with what I've just said, but I do want to correct where I think Lawrence is from. It would be a grave underestimation. It's not to say that NATO is a complete weakness with regard to its military capabilities, but I'm trying to give you some idea of what I think Russia thinks about it and what we divined from our stay in Moscow a few weeks ago. The final issue I want to raise about Russia, and I'm very much compressing a 5,000-word article here, is some of the disturbing geopolitical propositions that have been gaining traction in Moscow. Most prominently, there is the idea of Eurasia, which Putin is proselytizing. Starting with the Slavophiles in the 19th century, many Russian intellectuals saw Europeanness as the main problem of defining Russia's nationhood. Since 1991, the terms Eurasia and Eurasianism have once again come on the post-Soviet political scene. As Marlene Laruelle states in her book about Eurasianism, this terminology suggests that Russia occupies a dual or median position between Europe and Asia. It rejects the view that Russia is on the periphery of Europe, and on the contrary, it interprets the country's geographic location as grounds for choosing a messianic third way. Neo-Eurasianism has found its place within the new patriotic doctrine of Putin's Russia. And the main proponent of the new geopolitical right wing is one Alexander Dugin. Uh, 
Before that, it was proselytized by Lev Gumilov, the son of the famous Russian poet uh, Anna Akhmatova, and before that in the 19th century by Nikolai Danilevsky, who wrote a famous book about the inevitability of war between Russia and Europe. Dugan opposes American globalization and describes his geopolitical doctrines as sacred geography, Sakralnaya Geographia. In his book, and listen to the title, The Last War of the World Island, Dugan argues that Russia's return to its geopolitical function as the continental heartland, his word, a concept he deliberately copies from Halford Mackinder, he identifies Russia as a civilization of land, he calls that telluric, and that Russia's occupation of the heartland is the land-based core of the entire Eurasian continent in what he describes as its unchanging geopolitical space, Ramsin. Dugan proclaims that Russia is doomed to conflict with the civilization of the sea, Thalassic, embodied today in the United States and the unipolar America central world order. You may ask, what is some academic, what sort of influence does he have? Well, it should be noted his books are assigned as required reading, as textbooks at the General Staff Academy and other military universities. He's been quoted by Nikolai Patrashev, the Secretary General of the Security Council, and Putin regularly now uses the phrase Eurasia. Let me stress there'll be many in this audience that disagree with what I have to say. If you're interested in what I have to say, ASPI two weeks ago produced a 10,000 word document and we're going to try and get some copies to some of you. China. Unlike Russia, China has not yet used direct military power to assert its territorial claims. But it is using such harsh coercion that like Russia, it is causing extreme apprehension in its neighborhood. We heard today how China continues to assert the right to use military force to recover Taiwan and has built up powerful military forces opposite Taiwan. And when some people argue that, you know, America needs to move over and allow China strategic space, we need to ask those people, what do you mean? What strategic space? Is it the sacrifice of the democracy of a vital um, Taiwan of 24 million people on the name of trading off strategic pay space or indulging in some so-called grand bargain. Not for me. China's territorial ambitions in the South and East China Seas have been pursued with great belligerence in recent years, and in my view are the most likely source of miscalculation leading to direct military conflict with the US and its allies. We know that China is heavily dependent upon unhindered maritime traffic through the South China Sea, through which one third of the world's trade and 80% of China's imports pass. When President Xi Jinping terms China's Malacca dilemma, the bottleneck of the Malacca Straits, this has led him in part, in my view, to be driven to propose a geopolitical alternative called One Belt, One Road, that would see more secure Chinese transportation routes across the Indian Ocean as well as through Central Asia, which would avo avoid the strategic bottlenecks of Southeast Asia. All I have to say about that is, it will take some time to say the least. An important issue I want to raise with you is that, like Russia, China is a continental power with little historical experience of being a maritime power. Robert Ross has argued that China's maritime power will be limited by the constraints experienced by all land powers, including the geopolitical sources of the repeated failure of land powers to secure maritime power. His main thesis is that land powers confront in th internal threats that impose severe resource constraints in developing maritime power, whereas the geographic circumstances of maritime powers offers enduring internal border security and ready access to the sea. And he points out to the failure of the Soviet Union and Germany with regard to maritime power. And it's a telling point in this regard, by the way, that China continues to spend as much on internal security as it does on defense buildup. With regard to China's territorial ambitions, I think right now it is backing off somewhat with regard to the Senkaku Daiutai Islands, where of course America's made it clear they come under the treaty with Japan. 
So it's turning its focus heavily onto the South China Sea and it's played its cards craftily by undertaking land reclamation, building infrastructure and introducing so-called habitation on an incremental basis, whilst at the same time avoiding, so far, the direct use of military force. It has persistently lied about not militarizing, militarizing these islands, rocks and reefs, and China does all this while asserting that it has, quote, indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea and adjacent waters. I'm not going to address uh, the findings of the arbitration uh, court. My friend uh, Ewan, I think, will raise that. So while China claims it remains committed to resolving the relevant disputes through negotiation and consultation with the countries directly concerned on the basis of respecting historical facts, there can be, in my view, no expectation of any resolution of this potentially dangerous territorial standoff. And in particular, and you'll hear me say this in a moment, not least because of the weakness and the divisions within a very damaged ASEAN, who I've spent 10 years of my life negotiating with, to no avail. Tension seems certain now to rise, in my view, and it remains to be seen what Beijing's next step will be. Australia's former ambassador to China, Jeff Raby, believes that in the end, all that is left is diplomacy, and that negotiation between claimant states is the only path towards some sort of resolution. But he also acknowledges that China's leaders are now under enormous popular pressure to be seen to be standing up for China's territorial sovereignty. He acknowledges that any sign of weakness in the face of what will be seen widely in China as a territorial humiliation by the Court of Arbitration will provide a legitimate opening to attacking Xi Jinping. So the fact now is there's a much greater chance of miscalculation or ac accidental military confrontation. I acknowledge there are those who believe, and there's power in this thought, that China and America are now so intertwined economically that military conflict is out of the question and now is the time for restraint. That may be true, but in my view, I'm no longer an official and haven't been for a long time, in my view, the time has come when the US and its allies, including Australia, will have to demonstrate to China that we cannot make that, he, that China cannot make unilateral territorial land grabs. This will involve us clearly undertaking deliberate and separate freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea and conducting regular intrusive aerial surveillance. There is one final Chinese territorial pro proposal I need to address. In the various regional fora, forum I've experienced, including this particular ARF forum I've been involved with, China is pushing hard the idea of a need for a comprehensive review of regional security architecture. This includes examining the rationale for and ingredients of a new security order for the region at a time of major rebalancing between rising and established powers. The idea here is in the Chinese words to critically revisit the existing security order, including the system of bilateral alliances. And I've told the Chinese representatives that is a dangerous proposition and they should be careful what they wish for. Because the collapse of the US alliance system in our region would inevitably lead to a nuclear armed Japan within 18 months of a decision, a nuclear armed South Korea and Taiwan, which would arguably against China's national interests. It might lead to some other countries reviewing their situation. Okay, turning now quickly to Australia's new strategic geography. America's pivot to Asia, mainly to counter China's rise in the region, has made Australia's geographical location much more important than in the Cold War. In the Cold War, Australia was distant from the main theatres of military confrontation in Europe and in Northeast Asia. Now, however, Australia is critically located between the Indian and Pacific Oceans and relatively near to Southeast Asia and the South China Sea flashpoint. Unlike US military forces stationed in Japan, South Korea and Guam, Australia is not within the range of China's anti-access area denial weapons. Australia can offer America access to naval harbours and military airfields in the west and north of Australia so it can project power into the eastern Indian Ocean and Southeast Asian waters. Southeast Asia is of critical importance to Australia's security and you can see it on that map. It is a shield to Australia's sparsely populated and resource-rich northern approaches. 
we would be concerned about the threat of a foreign military power seeking a sphere of influence in Southeast Asia in ways that could ultimately challenge the security of our maritime approaches. Very quickly, classified concerns about China's military buildup and its continuing provocations in the China, South China Sea caused the 2016 Defence White Paper released in February to elevate the security of Southeast Asia, particularly maritime Southeast Asia, to Australia's most important strategic interest after the defence of the continent and our northern approaches. As the White Paper observes, the geography of the archipelago to Australia's immediate north will always have particular significance to our security because any conventional military threat is most likely to approach through the archipelago. Finally, in addition to its heavy focus on maritime Southeast Asia, the White Paper revisits the importance of Australia's military facilities in the remote north and west of the continent, which have been run down in recent years. Um, these facilities uh, will have enhanced capabilities to support joint strike fighters, wedge tail early, born, early warning and control aircraft and air to refuelers, the over, over the rise in Jindalee radar network and other surveillance space and air defence facilities in the north will be upgraded. There is also a commitment, which is very important, to upgrade the infrastructure on Cocos Keeling Islands in the Indian Ocean to support flights by the new P-8A Poseidon maritime surveillance aircraft and give access to America for that. So, my final words. With regard to Australia, all this that I've described to you amounts to a significant geographical refocusing of the Australian Defence Force, which has been preoccupied over the last 15 years with almost continuous deployments to the Middle East and Afghanistan. The geographical refocus now on maritime Southeast Asia and the complementary upgrading of military bases in the vulnerable north of Australia after years of lack of attention marks, in my view, and I'm biased, a triumphant return of geography to Australia's defence planning. Thank you. Um, happy birthday, SDSC. Could I ask for the map to be um, restored? I'm going to try and free ride off that. Thank you. Um, that's the one. Thank you uh, to Brendan Taylor um, and SDSC for the invitation to come back home in a way. I came here as, in 1996 as a milk bottle white, fresh-faced PhD candidate, uh, and it's great to see where SDSC has, has come since. Um, you've got it in a, in a good place, so congratulations, Brendan. Um, the composition of this panel is also perfect in a way. Um, I don't know whether that was coincidental or not, but. Um, Tim Huxley was the reason um, that I first chose SDSC for my PhD. Um, uh, he was my supervisor in the University of Hull, so the, the path led from there. Paul was um, head of centre when I arrived. Um, and Joan, who I just met last week, um, uh, came to a session we held at the Lowy Institute. We don't normally do historical retrospectives, uh, but we couldn't move past the... Um, opportunity of the 100th anniversary of Fromel to have a, uh, a retrospective uh, with Sir Hugh Strawn, also um, here for this event uh, as a participant. So it's, uh, it's all come together nicely. My brief was to speak about maritime strategy in Asia, which I'm going to uh, introduce and abuse um, to talk about the South China Sea. Um, which is a bit of a sin because there is obviously a lot more uh, at play in the region other than the South China Sea, but I think it's the issue of the day and it, and it, uh, it merits some concentration. Uh, maritime strategy, if not careful, um, leads all too easily into abstract statements that encourage a deterministic view of great power competition leading to armed conflict. And when talking about the South China Sea, one has to be doubly careful to avoid platitudes um, because so much ink has been spilled on the subject. So I tread rather carefully. Um, but nonetheless, I think the military strategic element is undoubtedly growing as a driver in the South China Sea, and maybe it will become its defining characteristic in future as China's defense infrastructure is developed more overtly on the artificial islands and its maritime power projection grows more generally and in reaction 
uh, other states in the region uh, continue to uh, reactively acquire more advanced um, military capabilities, which um, Till will, Tim no, will no doubt go on to um, talk about. There's also a nuclear dimension, which is um, becoming a growing influence on uh, the value that China places on the South China Sea. Paradoxically, promising to contribute to greater stability in US-China strategic relations at one level, um, while at the regional level, uh, undermining strategic stability as it encourages China to thicken its conventional military footprint in the South China Sea and to act increasingly, increasingly aggressively towards its rival territorial claimants, as well as the United States and its allies. However geostrategically important the South China Sea is, and the reason I want to free ride off that map is because you can see it sits perfectly central to this Indo-Pacific region that is now officially embraced in Australia. However important it is, I find it hard to reduce it to a, a classical strategic maritime paradigm, a la Mahan. Uh, it operates, I think, in parallel as a sort of symbolic sparring ground where normative factors are also in the mix. Personally, I'm skeptical that, South, that China is about to pull back um, anytime soon in the South China Sea, but last week's ruling out of The Hague uh, from the Permanent Court of Arbitration is, I think, a genuine inflection point, uh, a threshold, a window, if you like, between uh, where lawfare ends and warfare starts. Um, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but it may be the last best opportunity of its kind, I think, to, uh, to pull back from a spiral that's leading us somewhere uh, rather darker. Now, if China's expansionism in the South China Sea is driven solely by strategic motivations, that there is a plan and that plan is now um, unfolding inexorably, then I think it follows that the Hague ruling will have a marginal effect. After all, it's not enforceable. Um, Beijing would brush it aside, I think, and continue with the island building, the militarization of the features and assertions of historical rights, uh, it verging into the exclusive economic zones of Southeast Asian states that make up the majority, after all, of the South China Sea littoral. Um, if that is the case, then I think we're in for a much more overt strategic phase in the South China Sea. However, currently, uh, after, the, after the ruling, I do believe we are in a strategic pause. No more than that, um, but no less either. And I think there is a sliver of a hope. Uh, I put it as grimly as that, but a sliver nonetheless, that China will uh, recalibrate uh, on the basis of um, that ruling. I'll come back to that um, later on after taking a short historical intermission. Um, to look a little bit further back in the South China Sea and, and just how um, strategic it has been in the past. And it's striking, actually, looking back over the World Wars uh, and the Cold War, that the South China Sea has actually avoided major maritime conflict except around uh, its periphery. Uh, in the Second World War, Japanese forces invaded the Malay Peninsula through the South China Sea, uh, including the famous sinking of the Royal Navy battleships, the Prince of Wales uh, and Repulse, the first sinking by, um, by aircraft of, of battleships. That occurred at the southern edge of Kwantan, of, Mal of um, Malaya. But the South China Sea itself was not a focus for major naval battles uh, in the war that followed or operations for the remainder of the war. Japan maintained sea control within the first island chain and notably Japan also used the terminology of the first island chain and the second island chain in its strategic approach to the sea. Uh, until eventually um, the US um, um, challenged it on the eastern periphery by breaking through in the, in the Philippines. But there again, it was on the periphery of the South China Sea. Perhaps the most significant action to have occurred during the Second World War was the US submarine anti-shipping campaign, which is something I wrote about in my um, PhD thesis at SDSC. Um, that gets much less attention than it deserves, but it was centered uh, in particular on the Luzon Strait and the Bashi Channel uh, as the South China Sea's primary northern choke point controlling access into the Western Pacific. 
and not for coincidental reasons, that is again an area of strategic focus for denial and for control. In the post-1945 era, um, the Vietnam War was obviously the, mo the major um, conflict to have occurred uh, nearby the South China Sea, again fought on the periphery. It's not primarily thought of as a maritime campaign because US naval predominance uh, meant that it had the freedom to deploy air power and logistic supply chains from the sea right up to Vietnam's coastline without meaningful challenge. The 1964 Gulf of Tonkin incident was the trigger event for the US wider intervention against North Vietnam, but it remains one of very few maritime clashes to have actually escalated into a broader conflict. In, in many ways, I think it's, it's more of the exception that proves the rule. And the, in the, the other, um, the terminal phase of the US um, intervention in Vietnam was bookended by the mining of Haiphong Harbor in North Vietnam, notable as one of the very few miniature sea denial operations undertaken by the US since uh, the Second World War, and again occurring on the South China Sea's periphery. Following that, the, um, the, the current focus of strategic uh, uh, um, competition, the Paracel Islands and the Spratly Islands, uh, were throughout this period um, largely peripheral, uh, the exception being the um, uh, the small scale but still significant as a precedent and for understanding China's approach to, the, to maritime operations and uh, to the fusion of, um, of militia with regular forces, the 1974 takeover of the Paracel Islands. Following that, China and Vietnam clashed once again uh, in 1988 at Johnston Reef in the Spratlys, and that was the last real military clash involving loss of life. It's noteworthy that despite all the recurrent tensions since then, um, we haven't had any recurrence of that. Uh, despite the occupation of Mischief Reef in 1995, uh, or the, um, the standoff between the Philippines and China over Scarborough Shoal in 2012, neither resulted in military grey-on-grey -gray clashes. Losses of life have occurred uh, on a small scale, but mainly involving fishermen or, or law enforcement vessels. So what does this tell us, this historical intermission? Well, um, not exclusively, but I'll pick out a few points. The South China Sea has, has avoided major fleet actions throughout um, modern history, despite its importance to trade. The most notable naval operations have mainly been of a denial nature rather than a, a sea control nature. And notably, the two significant sea denial operations that I mentioned were in fact prosecuted by the United States. The importance of the South China Sea to submarine operations, perhaps uh, more inchoate uh, in that early period of history, has certainly now become uh, much more notable, it, for geographical reasons, being one of the largest, um, deepest bodies of water within the first island chain. And then finally, China's rise um, brings a, a new strategic dynamic. Um, the tensions have been constant um, but there is also a, a very contradictory, if you like, reluctance to use military force. Uh, the model of the Paracels takeover still applies. The reluctance to fire the first shot, winning without fighting, probing to see uh, what strategic gains could be made short of the threshold of armed force. So back to the permanent court of arbitration, uh, arbitration and, and to put it in a, a more recent context, where does China go from here? Uh, why do I think there's a sliver of a hope? Well, on the negative side, um, the chief of naval operations re recently met with um, Admiral Wu Sheng Li, his Chinese counterpart, uh, and reported out of that um, encounter, there was in fact uh, an insistence that China would continue to um, build its artificial structures without any delay or harassment, not to leave them um, half, half built. But China's actions since the ruling, China's actions, not its words, have been rather limited. Uh, there was a, an affirmation of the right to declare an, an air defense ident identification zone, but none has happened. What we've had instead are air combat patrols, but I would um, say there's a really no more than an aerial version of showing the flag. And the Philippines, which of course is the one that sinned in China's eyes by raising the court, the court case itself, has itself been relatively immune uh, 
from those sorts of physical kinetic uh, pressure tactics that have more recently actually been directed further south uh, towards Indonesia and Malaysia. But in the broader, um, more normative battle of wills that defines the geopolitical significance of the South China Sea, I think it's possible to see the, the permanent court of arbitration ruling in a rather more different and, and consequential light as the first real resistance that China has encountered, at least under Xi Jinping's watch, um, uh, as, as national leader. In that sense, I would actually um, regard it as something like a soft tripwire. Uh, it's, it's an asymmetrical approach to, um, that actually has caught China rather on the back foot, in my view, and has at least robbed it temporarily of the initiative. The strategic pause that we are seeing, I think, is a time for China really to um, digest the, the ruling in its entirety, uh, to, whip, to lick its wounds, if you like. Uh, it's not yet clear which direction it could go. Um, but although the court uh, ruling was uh, judged to be um, firmly on the Philippine side, and I think on 15 counts, Philippines um, got about 14 um, uh, ruled in its favor. Um, but nonetheless, I think um, there are um, ways in which China could come back at this without having to necessarily compromise on its core concerns. Uh, overriding uh, all of those is the notion of sovereignty, which has been a recurrent theme throughout today. I think there's scope, scope for China to do so without compromising on sovereignty. Um, that's the advantage of the way that the arbitra arbitral case was framed. Um, there is no adjudication on, on who owns what features. Uh, it is rather a ruling about what the features are entitled to generate in terms of maritime jurisdiction. China doesn't even have to drop the nine-dash line. Uh, reports that it's been declared illegal are, are somewhat exaggerated. It is rather the historical rights have been removed uh, um, in the court's view from uh, any entitlement from the nine-dash line, but the nine-dash line could be reinterpreted as a shorthand, a sort of cartographical device, if you like, um, but nonetheless one that can be brought into conformity with the UN law of the sea based on a claim solely to the high water features uh, within it. The, the ruling does require an adjustment um, from China on what it can claim in terms of jurisdiction from those land-based features, be they from China's coastline uh, from the islands uh, or from the rocks or, uh, or reefs. So far, Chinese statements, and it is early days, it's only been a week, point to a somewhat ambiguous um, but potentially uh, positive response. It's possible that Beijing will declare straight baselines in the Spratlys, which would not be a great outcome. Um, there is no entitlement to do so. Uh, under the law of the sea, China has already done, done that in, in the Paracels. Um, that's one possibility. Historic rights, I think there will be no resiling from that either. But where those historic rights are asserted and how they are asserted could also change. Um, there is at least one piece of evidence that suggests uh, that China will, instead of um, be claiming uh, unilateral jurisdiction of historical fishing rights, it's rather non-exclusive uh, access to uh, overlapping EEZs. Again, not, a, not an optimal outcome but an improvement and the trend line uh, for those within China who are um, uh, urging a position of caution, um, I think should be given the time to at least develop that, uh, uh, that position. Not open-ended, but we're talking really about a, a strategic interregnum, perhaps of a few weeks, maybe a little bit longer. But I think the PCA judgment, uh, the, its influence will more likely be felt in the long term rather than the short term. Uh, it tends to be that international law, because it's not enforceable, has a slower burn influence, uh, a more normative influence. Uh, and I think that will also take time to really uh, shake out. And beyond the South China Sea, the influence will also be felt um, for other um, questionable claims um, elsewhere in the region. And I think when those questionable claims are questioned, the challenge should be graciously accepted, I think, as a price worth paying for um, for the Philippines' contribution to the rules-based order. It's too early to say which, um, which way China will go. Um, I think the greatest uncertainty, and I'm not a China watcher or, and I don't read Chinese, but I think it seems to me um, entirely um, plausible and obvious that the, uh, 
potential for having essentially wrapped himself in the flag for Xi Jinping now to, to find himself a lightning rod for domestic criticism, if that's the route that it takes within China, could um, base essentially as a stark choice. China could either go hardline, double down on its claims, and then we see the unfolding of a strategic phase that'll be much more open in the South China Sea. And one way that might manifest, talking about domains, which is our brief after all, um, we have anti-submarine warfare, I think, already firmly established as a uh, operational focus for the South China Sea. Um, uh, air warfare, I think, will also be uh, an, a uh, related part of that, but also in the electronic domain. And thinking, after all, of um, uh, Des Ball, who was my supervisor at SDSC, um, if Des finds it within him to do a, a study of uh, the uh, electronic surveillance capabilities in those uh, reclaimed Spratly Island features, or well, that's something that SDSC itself um, could embrace as uh, some research, I think that would be a very valuable contribution. Just looking at the recent deployment of, um, of, uh, and of air uh, electronic warfare um, uh, uh, growler aircraft to the Philippines from the United States, I think, was a, uh, a straw in the wind of that particular um, dynamic. But as I say, I'm not um, wholly uh, pessimistic. I think there is a sliver of a hope. The door has been left open. Um, the finer points of the PCA judgment do actually, I think, allow China to maintain the core of its position, if it's imaginative in the way that it does so, and shows some genuine flexibility while the door is still open uh, and the hand held out from the Philippines, which I think has to be commended so far for its humble, low-key, um, but so far firm approach uh, in having um, uh, refused China's um, initial demand um, to drop the ruling in it as a basis for bilateral negotiations. Uh, the one um, outlier, and I think um, just to finish on a point of detail, but I think if we're looking for where um, point of tension might resurface, uh, post-ruling, it would be mis mischief reef, because I think a clear implication of the ruling uh, is that uh, China is in a state of uh, unlawful occupation of that feature, which is a low tide feature, now within an unopposed um, exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. Um, the Philippines has been, um, I think, cautious sensibly in how uh, it has um, uh, uh, not let to that conclusion, but I think that's the clear um, next line of, uh, of legal uh, manoeuvre uh, and one that might also um, lead to uh, a recalibrated approach on the United States part uh, in view of potential freedom of navigation operations and the allies that will take part alongside in that. So um, thank you very much. I'll conclude there. Before starting, I'd like to thank Brendan Taylor and the SDSC for the very kind invitation uh, to this conference and to uh, speak here this afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be involved in this event, uh, particularly as my own connection goes back 36 years um, to my time as a PhD student in the IR department under Bob O'Neill's supervision starting in uh, January 1980. <coughs> in my presentation this afternoon, I'm going to talk about the development of military capabilities in the broad uh, Asia region. Um, I'll, I'll also attempt, uh, perhaps uh, presumptuously, uh, to draw out some implications uh, for Australia. Uh, over the last 50 years, the distribution of military power in what I've called here the Indo-Asia Pacific region uh, has evolved significantly. At the same time, uh, the relative weight of Asian states' military power in global terms has increased and clearly continues to increase. Compare the few pages that were devoted to Asia in the 1966 edition of the Military Balance uh, produced by my current employer with the substantial uh, Asia-Pacific sections in the most recent uh, 2016 edition. In broad terms, uh, this re redistribution of military power has reflected the economic success of many Asian states and the 
the decline over time in the relative economic strength of the United States and the West in general. But Asian states didn't need automatically to divert such large resources to their armed forces. This process has also reflected a determined effort by Asian political elites to strengthen their country's military power. There have been diverse re reasons for this, but the most important reason for governments across uh, the region to do this has been their pervasive and uh, persistent sense of insecurity in relation to other states, ranging from neighboring countries to extra-regional powers. But, but what do we mean by military power? The focus for many, perhaps most academic investigations of military power in our region has been on the relatively more easily understood metrics of military spending, weapons procurement, and armed forces personnel strength. But we know, in reality, these can only provide the crudest indications of the value of a country's armed forces. If we are to understand better the region's military dynamics, then we need to think more clearly about military capability. In other words, the capacity of armed forces to engage in combat effectively uh, or, to defer, or, or to deter uh, likely adversaries. Ultimately, spending a lot of money on the armed forces, having large numbers of military personnel, and even buying the types of weapon systems often enumerated by academic researchers, not to mention the media, may mean little unless the other elements that go into making military capability uh, are in short supply. As well as some less easily identifiable equipment-based elements, notably in the realms of logistics, C4 ISR, including space-based assets, EW, and cyber, other important capability elements include, but, not, but are by no means limited to, operational experience, alliance relations and other international partnerships, training standards, morale, leadership, defense industrial R&D and defense science capacity, and community support. That these absolutely vital elements of military capability are difficult to measure and to assess, I think is axiomatic. That's why defense ministries and armed forces have intelligence directorates. Nevertheless, the expert community is capable of making useful capability assessments based on the application of military and country-specific expertise and experience and linguistic knowledge to open source materials. Over the last decade, there's been, in particular, an impressive expansion of research and publication on the Chinese PLA. Other national military capabilities in Asia haven't been the focus of anything like so much attention. But the, uh, the series published by Allen and Unwin uh, on the armed forces of Asia, uh, uh, this is a series for which Des Ball was the series editor 15 or 20 years ago, did provide some detailed, nuanced analyses of the military capabilities of a range of regional states and perhaps provides a model that might be used in the future for looking at Asian states' military capabilities more carefully. Meanwhile, uh, the Defense and Military Analysis Program at the IISS, where I work, uh, has continued to develop the military balance into what we hope will be an even more useful tool for comparing states' national military power, including in this region. Over the last five or six years, we've added narrative assessments of national military capabilities to this annual publication. We intend to do much more in this respect, um, and we have a, we have a long-held ambition of transforming the military balance into an electronic beta, database, and that's going to become a reality within the next 12 months. How then have national military capabilities in this region evolved over the last 50 years. There's an obvious answer of, uh, there's an obvious danger of providing what, what might appear to be a, a glib response to this huge question, but I think it's possible to highlight some important evolving dimensions 
of Asian states' military capabilities. China has made huge strides in developing all-round capabilities, particularly over the last decade. And that success reflects a determined effort by the ruling party and the PLA eventually to, to become the preeminent military power in this region. And they've diverted massive resources to support this effort. The emphasis has been particularly on strengthening nuclear space and missile, naval and air capabilities. China has had considerable success in building an A2 AD anti-access area denial capability in its maritime littoral. But there are, there are important weaknesses in China's capabilities, despite all these efforts and all the resources that have gone into them. Embargoes on defense-related imports since 1989 have severely restricted access to Western technology. The PLA's historical land focus has meant that it has necessarily developed many capabilities from an extremely low base. As recently as the 1979 war with Vietnam, for example, China had no useful air power. And of course, the, PL <coughs> the PLA has had absolutely no significant operational experience since that war. A war in 1979 with a much smaller country, uh, and it was, a, it was a conflict which was at best a draw with Vietnam. And moreover, corruption within the party and within the PLA will have an unquantifiable sapping effect on morale and the effectiveness of leadership. In some, the PLA is not a 10-foot giant. Other states in the broad Asian region have also made major capability development efforts, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't view these as overshadowed by China's. India is emerging as a major military power. Its capabilities are built on a strong military tradition and considerable operational experience. There are well-known weaknesses in India's defense industry, but the potential for New Delhi to import defense equipment and technology relatively freely more than compensates for that weakness. India is now beginning to assert itself as a significant naval power. Japan has self-imposed considerable constraints on the development of its armed forces, but under Shinzo Abe's second leadership, these are being systematically removed or loosened. There are weaknesses in Japan's defense and security establishment, notably in terms of institutional stovepiping. And the future of the ongoing defense reforms is vulnerable to political changes, which could see a less security-oriented leadership after Abe. But it's impressive that Tokyo has already used defense spending capped at around 1% of GDP to develop a self-defense force with impressive capabilities, particularly in the naval sphere. The region's small and medium powers have demonstrated what I suppose you could call mixed determination and success in their capability development efforts. Among the most impressive, though in quite different ways, are those of the two Koreas. North Korea's nuclear and missile programs are remarkable for such a small, impoverished and isolated country, but they provide only limited military options for the country's leadership and must ultimately be judged as self-defeating. It's clear that any real capability to reach the continental US with nuclear missiles would risk an American preemptive strike. The Republic of Korea, contrastingly, has built armed forces with powerful capabilities relevant not just to deterring the North, but also to projecting maritime power. Taiwan's defense effort was unimpressive under the recently departed KMT administration, and the military balance across the Taiwan Strait shifted in favor of the mainland. But the new president, Tsai Ing-wen, seems set on increasing defense spending, boosting Taiwan's defense industry, ordering new equipment from the US, and revising the former administration's plans to reduce the size of the army. In the medium term, those measures may improve the contribution that Taiwan can make to its own defense. In Southeast Asia, some states, notably Myanmar and the Philippines, have arm, army-dominated armed forces that remain, to a greater or lesser extent, focused on the demands of internal security. Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand have developed their air forces and navies, but inefficient procurement decisions 
involving multiple foreign sources have tended to undermine efforts to build coherent capabilities. As Indonesian concerns over the threat to its interests from China's assertiveness in the South China Sea grows, we may see a more concerted effort to enable the TNE to contribute more effectively to the country's maritime strategy. Meanwhile, two Southeast Asian states have for decades taken the deterrence of external threat extremely seriously, Singapore and Vietnam. The capability development efforts of Singapore and Vietnam have also benefited from the support of political leaderships which have been able to plan for the long term and also from strong economies. So it's evident that not only China, but also India, Japan, the ROK, and some Southeast Asian states have developed military capabilities that would have been hard to imagine 50 years ago when the SDSC was established, or even when I was first in the Coombs building looking at Asian armed forces at the beginning of the 1980s. Within their own sub-regional environments, China and some other Asian armed forces have developed what may be effective capabilities for A to AD. We don't know how effective until there's a conflict, which we must all hope, of course, will never happen. Despite our Asian armed forces growing capabilities, it seems clear that for many years to come, the US will remain the preeminent military power in the region. As US Defense Secretary Ashton Carter emphasized when he spoke at the 15th IISS Shangri-La Dialogue last month, the US maintains its world-leading military capabilities because, as he put it, of incomparable investments over decades. So it will take decades or more, he said, before any others can build similar capabilities. Those capabilities are based on America's innovative technological culture and its unrivaled operational experience as well as financial investment. But over the coming years, if China, by far the most likely adversary in the region apart from North Korea, remains on more or less the same economic and capability development trajectory uh, that we've seen over the last decade, that's a big assumption, uh, but, but perhaps a reasonable assumption. In that case, US military preeminence will inevitably be eroded. China's A2 AD capabilities are, are already complicating US contingency planning. While the logic that America's strategic weight should be focused on the region that is of greatest long-term importance for the US in economic and security terms is clear, we can't be sure that the rebalance to the Asia-Pacific is going to endure in the face of an evolving military balance uh, that is changing and also budgetary challenges. I've deliberately left consideration of Australian military capabilities until last. Given the likely size of Australia's future economy and population, even in 2066, when the SDSC celebrates its 100th anniversary, uh, Australia, is like, uh, it, Australia is unlikely to be one of the world's major military powers. However, the country's sustained economic growth and successive governments' commitments to substantial funding for defense have ensured that it's not a negligible military power either. Australia has substantial military capabilities, particularly in terms of air and naval power, and those are set to continue growing in absolute terms over the coming decades. Whatever one's view on the choice of partner for the new submarine program, it remains an important initiative with the potential to tran to transform the Royal Australian Navy's long-range striking power. The, the development of an amphibious warfare capability is also significant in regional terms, and the Air Force will be transformed with the introduction of the F-35 to operate alongside force multipliers such as the KC-30 and Wedgetail. But these continuing Australian capability improvements are not happening in a sub-regional vacuum. If their long-term strategic benefit is to be maximized, they need to fit into a regional strategy that will help reinforce the existing Indo-Asia-Pacific security order in the face of growing challenges. Those challenges include not only China's assertiveness and the threat that that poses to maritime freedoms, uh, 
and the threat from North Korea, but also the risk of declining US capacity and will in the long term. Allies and security partners need to play their part in a more coordinated fashion in maintaining the current regional order. When Ash Carter spoke at the most recent Shangri-La Dialogue, he referred repeatedly to what he called a principled security network for the region. From Australia's perspective, alliance with the US forms an overarching framework for engagement in that network. But on its own, it's insufficient to provide a synergizing context for Australia's defense efforts. It will also be important to continue deepening cooperation with not only the other major US regional ally, Japan, but also the most important US security partner, India. This is already happening, but a major push might be needed to restore the momentum of military cooperation with Japan in the wake of the decision on submarine procurement. The area of regional defense cooperation that needs substantially more attention, though, concerns the development of much closer strategic links with Southeast Asian partners. As Ben Schreer and I have argued in a recent op-ed, if Australia wants to play a strategically significant role in Southeast Asia, perhaps it needs to think in terms of dramatically rather than incrementally extending and deepening its defense cooperation with key states there, particularly Singapore and Indonesia. In the medium to long term, such steps could add up, could add up to movement towards a coalition type arrangement between Australia and key Southeast Asian partners. The alternative to Australia becoming uh, increasingly enmeshed with regional partners might be to be increasingly vulnerable to changes in the regional distribution of military power. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to our th three speakers. Um, we have, I think, about 20 minutes for um, comments and questions. Yes, Rob. Microphones? <coughs> No, no, it's uh, down towards this, the second table from the front, please. Doesn't seem to be, no. But I think... Do you want to just come up to the podium? Might be an idea. Oh no, here comes the microphone. A brilliant student to the rescue. Well, this is the the pen. Is that with me? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the, sorry, I need to steal the, steal, but one of the interesting issues is there's a lot, there's, and this is for all three, there's clearly arms build ups, there's clearly pushing and probing, there's a fluid distribution of power. But to pick up on one of the points of a couple of you, there's not much evidence of, of knowing what the operational experience and capabilities of these various forces are. I guess my question is, how worried should we be about an unintentional conflict in maritime Asia based on misperception and misjudgment of each other's capabilities and willingness to do something? I don't think there are many actors in the region that actually want to fight but they may get themselves into a situation where, because of misjudgment and misperception, you know, a, a gap that isn't there or a, or, a, or a gap that they don't see that is there, they may get themselves into, into deep trouble because of the, basically they just don't get the, they just, their assessments of the distribution of military power and military commitment is, 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 is completely off. So could I ask that question? Who would like to start? Um, I, I can you say are? a few words if you like. Um, Yes and no. I mean, I think the, the focus on unintentional conflict is, is uh, justified, but it's not, it's not the only thing that should be focused on, because if all of the focus is on um, conflict by 
misperception. I think it misses maybe the broader strategic risk of precisely an approach that's premised on uh, pushing but below that, that threshold. So it's not a panacea, but it, it, it can play a compartmentalized and important role in minimizing the danger of conflict. Um, I worry about the inexperience level, if there is that um, uh, unintended flashpoint. Um, you don't want to be the first, um, particularly um, Chinese military leader, to lose a war that's been um, fought with a military built up at such vast expense for such a long time, in which effectively the national prestige is, is riding riding on. We, we don't think very much about wars of demonstrations um, anymore. I think we probably do need to think more about that in our region. Um, it may not be through um, a deliberate war of aggression, but I think that demonstration dynamic certainly does kick in uh, if there is uh, an armed conflict through uh, miscalculation, the escalation risks that, that will flow from that. I think the, um, one of the serious concerns which I alluded to uh, that it didn't have sufficient time to address is our Chinese friends. Um, we've just got to be careful not to build up the so-called military threat from China in the way we did the Soviet threat and look what happened to the Soviet Union. Um, there is naturally, particularly in the United States, an inclination to be looking always for a serious threat and let's not pretend that terrorism and counterinsurgency is, is a serious issue. Um, it has to be fought, but when you're looking as a trained military force and the best one in the world, then you're looking for um, a peer competitor or, or somebody who can be argued to be coming one. I think the issue with China is, as Ewan alluded and so, so did uh, uh, the, the, uh, the issue is with regard to China, it has no military experience. It has never fought armed combat since 79, and as you said, uh, and I was in the intelligence community at the time, as we watched four divisions come down, we knew their call, call signs, and we watched the, the fight with a battled heart in the North Vietnamese division. Uh, at the most, as you say, you, and it was a draw, and there was a tremendous loss of face. Um, when you look at um, China's military capabilities, of course they've made progress. As a colleague of mine said today, um, uh, that um, they, they're getting maritime experience, they're operating off the east coast of Africa, and so on. But other friends of mine who've been on board these ships say they're very pretty, they're very nice, but they have no operational or combat experience. Mm. America has no, enormous combat experience. We have a Chinese military that has been trying for 35 years to develop a high-performance military jet engine and has failed. Where does it get them from? A place called Russia. You know, its anti-submarine warfare capabilities are poor. Mm. Hmm? Its newly launched ballistic missile firing submarine makes as much noise as a Soviet-era Delta III. God is that noisy. Now, look, don't get me wrong, and as Ewan says, when we're looking back, you know, beyond my interest, beyond 20 years, <laughs> um, uh, who knows? But America's innovation, as put it, my personal view, has put it at least 20 years ahead of China in key high-grade technological capabilities. Now, it is true also that Japan doesn't have combat experience, and there's some of the risks as they circle around each other in, you know, naval manoeuvres, confrontations, and so on. Tim, did you want to add anything? Yeah, yes, just um, very, very briefly, Rob, I suppose there are, there are two ways of, of managing that risk. Uh, one, one is through deterrence, um, which, which um, should, at least in theory, um, re reduce the temptation to, to risk-taking behaviour on the part of a, an adversary. In the, and the, the second response is to, um, to, to build um, uh, uh, conflict management uh, strategies through the implementation of, uh, of, of cues and uh, other measures from the tactical level uh, upwards to make sure that if, if there is a, an accidental uh, confrontation or exchange of fire, uh, it, uh, there, there are fire breaks there to, uh, to prevent escalation. Tim, I think the other concern related is 
unlike Europe in the Cold War, in this part of the world, there are no nuclear arms control agreements, there are no counting yes. rules for nuclear weapons, there are no in, in, intrusive portal gate inspections of ICBMs, there's no conventional forces in Europe type agreement, and we've only just got the um, avoidance of naval yeah. incidents at sea agreement, but no such bilateral agreement between China and Japan. Mm. Huh? So I think there is concern, yeah. and, and it needs a lot more progress, and we're not getting it in the mm. multilateral forums. Mm. All we're getting is flim flam. Mm. Mm. So in other words, it, 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 we need some arms control measures in the region. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, up the back, thank you. I can't see who it is. But, oh, Ron. Uh, Ron Huskin, Strategic and Defence Studies. Uh, a very interesting panel, and I think what it brought home to me is that there are many ways in the Asia-Pacific where we have flashpoints of various degrees of severity that could provide a spark that would darken the sort of political and strategic future in the region. But one of them certainly is the South China Sea. And what, what fascinates me in a way is that China's been sitting on this position for about 60 years. Uh, the three speakers have been, all contributed to a, a very gradual process of incidents related with the advancement of that position, um, the use of military force against South Vietnam and then Vietnam, uh, uh, mischief Reef, Scarborough Shoal and so on. One has to believe two things. One is that over those 60 years, the Politburo has at least periodically looked at the claim and the status of uh, China's objectives with respect to that claim. Can we suppress opposition to where we want to go in a decent time frame and get what we want? And the answer appears to have been yes, 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 down the line. And then you get the island project. Seven new islands in eight months, starting around about October 2014, ending in June of 2015. A stunt by any, a spectacular, visible, high risk uh, proposition. And it seems to me that if we want to understand whether there are, we're going to manage the, the post arbitration future in the South China Sea, we have to understand where the key players are coming from. And with respect to China, was there something in the years, two, three years ahead of 2014? that caused the Politburo to say, hang on a minute, We've, we're at risk, our position, so our objective and the confidence we have in success in achieving that objective doesn't exist anymore. It's at, it's at risk. We need to take a higher risk strategy to create an ir irreversible new reality as quickly as possible. And I wonder if the panel has any thoughts on what that trigger might have been. Thank you. In, in my view, I think the obvious trigger was the legal case itself, because the, the legal note was submitted by the Philippines in January to 2013. Pretty soon after that, the, the island building campaign um, started in, in earnest. In one sense, that, that, that was a preemptive response on China's part to say, well, whatever uh, the ruling come judgment day, um, we'll be here, we'll be up close in your face, if you like. Uh, irreversibly. Um, also from China's perspective, although I doubt there are many who here who would agree with it, but from China's point of view that was also a, a restraint because it was also on the seven features that China already occupied. In other words, it wasn't going to engage in, in, in land grabs that reversed the, the current um, uh, state of play um, in terms of who, who occupied the other features. The outlier to that was Scarborough Shoal. I think that's why Scarborough Shoal is so important. I have heard um, that that was originally in the, um, the PLA's um, plan, but it was vetoed. It was vetoed at a political level because it was seen as too incendiary. That's why I think Scarborough Shoal has become um, so important because uh, it, it would be a, a clear um, new line, I mean, a red line in effect to go beyond uh, the fortification of, of already occupied features to uh, uh, one that has been contested and effectively um, removed from the administration of one country to, to another. Um, 
but I think you're right to, to draw this in, in long term, um, Ron, because the, the point I was trying to make with the historical retrospective is that this um, does go back several decades. There are, there are go slow periods, there are go fast periods, but very obviously China has a long standing strategic interest that transcends individual leaders. We have a particularly strong and committed leader in the form of Xi Jinping, but it goes, I think, deeper than that. Um, and uh, it would be, I think, unrealistic to expect China to um, reverse its occupation uh, of those islands, which is why I think Mischief Reef is the next one to look at. And the fact is, um, you know, you mentioned the Politburo, Ron. Unless I'm mistaken, we have no intelligence inside the Politburo, just like we never had inside the Kremlin. And yet intelligence agencies in the Cold War, like the CIA, would write highly classified documents, which I used to read, that would say, you know, the, the, the Kremlin thinks that, based on nothing. I mean, so, you know, it is a problem trying to read them. And as Ewan says, we need to look very carefully, not just what they say, but what they do. And, you know, just to be a bit oblique in response, one of the things, you know, that they could do is, in addition to the sorts of things that Ewan has mentioned, is they've now been stringing a broken-backed ASEAN group along for 14 years. How many years? 14. To negotiate a code of conduct in the South China Sea. And ASEAN seems, you know, content to put up with that. Although in my recent meetings with uh, the ASEAN group in March this year, you start to detect for the first time, and not just the Vietnam and the Philippines, but um, obviously Singapore and Indonesia starting. Do, do you agree? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, I think the, pro <clears throat> the, the, the problem with, uh, with, with, with ASEAN is that it, it, it includes a very diverse range of states, some, yes. so, some, of, some of which are small and, small and poor, um, and which, which, which China has, has strong uh, influence over. Do we have any other questions? Yes, a gentleman in the middle and then a gentleman to our, our right and on the left. Hi, uh, Andy Spriantho from SDSC. My question perhaps uh, relate to uh, Tim Huxley, but uh, I will come responses from other panelists. Um, it's about the prevalence of um, asymmetric maritime capabilities, um, uh, platforms and uh, weapon systems such as submarines, uh, naval mines, smart torpedoes, they are now um, cheaply available off the shelf from the market. And um, some people say that uh, this is a way for uh, smaller, weaker navies uh, to build their navies on the cheap. Um, my question is, um, to what extent uh, does this, uh, do these capabilities pose a threat or um, signify the beginning of the end of blue water capabilities such as uh, the uh, aircraft carriers and, and other uh, high, high value assets? Um, perhaps uh, it would be uh, useful to think uh, back in the um, Admiral, uh, Royal Navy Admiral uh, John Fisher era, uh, where it signifies the end of the battleship. Are we going to, are we seeing the cusps of a similar uh, revolution in uh, naval affairs? Thank you. I think we might take the second question since we've only got five minutes left and then the um, panel can respond to both questions. Thank you. Uh, Steve Meakin, uh, one for Paul. I very much enjoyed your return of geography, but uh, uh, rather, uh, moving to eternal Russia, you spoke a little about uh, the ambitions of uh, Putin, if that's a, a fair portrayal of it, but uh, I'd be interested in your views about how Putin reconciles the realities of the correlation of forces with a, uh, uh, I guess, an average male life expectancy of about where it was in this country at the time of Federation, declining birth rate, an economy that produces very little that's of interest to other countries, save for uh, hydrocarbons, weapons, and some metals. Right, well, they are quite separate questions, so perhaps we'll take the first one first. Who'd like to? Um, Jim? Yes, oh, uh, that's, that, uh, that's a good question, and it, 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 it's clear that, that um, many countries' uh, navies in, in Southeast Asia are beginning to uh, uh, ex expand or, or even uh, start uh, developing uh, submarine 
capabilities, but I, I, I wouldn't say that de developing a submarine capability um, is, a, is, an, is an easy or a, or a cheap uh, or a quick option. It's a, it's, it, it, it takes a long time to develop a submarine capability. It's difficult and it's expensive. Um, in, Indonesia has had um, a couple of Type 209s for, for many years, since the, since the 1980s, but I, um, but I understand that um, they, they, haven't, they haven't always been operational. Even, I mean, it's, it's actually been difficult uh, for Indonesia um, to, to use them. Um, so it's a, ma it's a major investment, and it's not, it's, it's not a cheap capability. So it's not asymmetric in that, in that sense. So I wouldn't lump submarines together with, uh, with, a, with a mine capability. Um, in, and then your, your next question was about uh, whether the development of um, submarine and other capabilities in the group that you talked about um, spelled the end of uh, uh, the usefulness of uh, aircraft carriers and other major surface vessels. Well, I think that, that depends on how strong the other side's ASW capability is. Because if the other side has a strong ASW capability, your, your submarines are useless. Uh, 